Designing a future is to take what you imagined and transform to something that exists. Everything in between is design. Some of the design work will disappear very soon to automation. Because some of it, I mean, we know how the body functions. We know more and more about the cognitive, uh, understanding of the cognitivity of the brain. So uh, computational design can happen to bootstrap design. So we don't have to do this by hand. And how would, where do they press? What do, how do they look? So we need to move design from this traditional design to computational design, to design of the futures with the tools that enables us, which is um, artificial intelligence and all these things. So design is changing face. It's a new thing. And I think maybe not everybody is aware about that uh, in the design community, that you design relationships, you design futures. The rest is actually easier than that. So start that. Don't design features, products, design service to, it, to serve someone so you gain a relationship. Start with a relationship, the rest will follow. You can imagine possibilities and futures, you can choose them, and then you can articulate them. So tell a story, narrate them, make a movie, make a picture, write a paper. <coughs> tell that story so you can have a conversation. And we articulate too little, we assume too much. We don't have a decent conversation with artifacts on the table that describe the possible futures. Now it's time, so design is changing shape in that from the traditional to uh, this kind of designing the future and then even the computational design when the world is, we can compute on the world because it's all connected. Everything that can be connected will be connected and that's everything. So everything is digital and manu you can manipulate it. You can code worlds, well, then you can design worlds. So computational design is another sphere that is opening up in front of our eyes right now. What they do, they take ingredients on the map, the objective ingredients, mobile telephony exists, everybody is empowered. Social confirmation is a thing, right? They, just, it, they didn't create it, it's just objectively there. And then they build narratives. And to take it really far out, in a scary way, because it sells, we, it's a good drama to scare someone, to ask the question, is this the future we want? Obviously not. That, that's the prerequisite for a black mirror, you know? The, ref, the black reflection of humanity. What if everything goes wrong? <laughs> right? And that's good. Because now we can start a conversation. This is a conversation piece, like a piece of art. What does it mean? What questions does it ask? It's not an answer. If people watch Black Mirror as an answer, they're doing something wrong. You should watch it as a question for how would you make it differently in extreme, instead of this extreme negative, extremely positive way that you talk in. So yes, it's inspirational. Good discussion started. We map objectively what's happening. Say blockchain is happening, right? Machine learning is happening. We, we could look at it and just say, this is happening, globalization is happening. Different uh, business models are happening there. Fine. Put them on a map. And it's very nice because then you can have a map of possibilities. Because as soon as you put things on a map, you see how they relate to each other or could relate. So you draw lines and you connect these dots and they become narratives. So we will have three billion new minds connected to internet, enabled with fantastic technologies and three billion just in, say, five years, they, because, because of the technology accessibility. These people, statistically, there should be an Einstein somewhere there, right? Could be a Hasso Plattner, could be an Elon Musk or whoever, a new Marie Curie. These people will then create new startups, new business models that will be enabled. The authorities moving to, that's a narrative. I'm just taking that narrative because it's possible from the dots. Now we write these narratives, that's the next step. And they, some, it's full spectrum. Some of them are very dystopian. And Hollywood is great at that. Newspapers are great at that. You eat this and you will die. Uh, everybody's going to take your job. <laughs> you know, all that bullshit. They are possible. They are unlikely. And they sell well because our brain is wired for fear. So you have all these spectrums. 
and you choose to focus on the absolute positive ones, the impactful positive ones, because we do this too little. And our brain is wired also like that. When you tell people a narrative, they go for it. So choose the positive one to tell them, like, hey, how about going to the moon within 10 years and bring the guy back? It's a good narrative, right? And people just did. How about have a system that you can talk to and have a conversation about your business where it actually handles your ambiguity, saying, hey, system, how am I doing today? It's a super hard question to answer unless you know me. Hey, how about have a system that knows me? That's a hard problem, we're working on that. It's a nice narrative. When you choose the positive ones, then you can see where am I gifted as an organization, as a team, as a person? Where are my gifts to actually actualize this, to make it happen? Is it us? Is it these guys? Can we hook up with them or should we just leave it to them? And then you choose where you can have a very positive impact with that narrative you chose to pursue. Then you have a strategy. People usually start with strategies and that's a little bit late. The hard work is before. What are the right things to do? When you have a strategy, you focus on doing the things right. People are used to do things right. How? We look at the what and the why. And that's important. So we have a pretty pretentious, bold vision, you know, to make the world run better and improve people's lives. Wow. So <laughs> that should get you up on Monday morning. Hmm. How am I going to improve people's lives? Not only for the customer, but the customer must be enabled to improve their uh, customers' or consumers' lives in some way. How can we reduce the friction and how can we simplify the complexity through, with the help of, of thorough design, empathy, innovation and systems and technologies that help people to live better, stay in a flow where they can be the, the optimal them better and better growing so the flow is actually pointing upwards so um, i sometimes say even that uh, you know technology helps us to focus on more human tasks like conversation like ideation like creating new futures like imagining new business models uh, these things y machines can yet not do well because they are hard to digitize exchange experiences um, reach consensus solve complex human problems for, for businesses and for relationships with your customers and so on. That's human work. But now we can be augmented with the machines. The superhuman abilities are now reachable for us. And we can automate everything that was friction from a way where it was repeatable, where it was mundane and sometimes really boring, actually. So that friction is also gone and we can have bigger intent. So the best system in the world is the, the smartest system in the world is the one that makes you smarter. Human is always in the center. So now, maybe if you prolong it to some kind of philosophical standpoint, maybe we become human at last. Maybe we are something we don't know yet that we can be. You know, the Homo sapiens, we've been busy hunting and gathering all these years. <laughs> well, a little bit more. There have been some other industrial revolutions since then. But in the essence, maybe we're reaching a state where we can leverage the human and the human gifts, for example, at work, to a level we haven't imagined. Yet. And th th this, that purpose and that diversity of thought that we have together make, make this a very unique space to, to, to innovate for the future and design new futures.